I want to hear more about your, I know you worked full time before. Um, I want to hear more about those roles and, and how you've transitioned into the specific industries you're in. Cause I believe health and fitness is really where you live. I'd love to hear about your experience and like the things you're passionate about that have kind of led to those niches. Sure. So I, I got into freelancing in 2012, so it's been 10 years for me at this point. Um, and I am a, a fairly risk averse person. So I, I kept my day job for half a decade before I quit to, to freelance full time. So I spent five years getting up at five in the morning, doing client work before I went into the office, coming home from work and, and taking care of projects in the evening, ducking out on a lunch break and taking calls. And like, so when I try to make sure that I bring that up because a lot of people will look and see where I am today, a full decade into my career. And, and, and they'll feel bad about the fact that they're not at that place when they've only been freelancing for a year or two years. And, you know, if you could, if you look at, at what I was doing in my first and second year, many of the people who are feeling bad and comparing themselves to where I am today, they're doing better than I was right. in my first and second year. Yeah. So if only I could somehow like, you know, become the Benjamin Button and turn the clock back on myself and, and let them compare themselves to the me of, 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 you know, 2013, 2014, yeah. it would help. I would think it'd help take away a lot of their sort of feelings of, of whether it's self doubt or, or sort of comparisonitis. Um, so I, I was working full time at a, in, in marketing and in, in consulting for a, like a, it's like a large government contractor who had a division that they, that was effectively its own advertising agency. Okay. So we, we were listed on like the PR week agency rankings and stuff. So it was really like a, a marketing firm nested inside a, a larger government contractor. I did that for a couple of years. That's where I was when I started freelancing on the side. Then uh, a friend of mine who I played hockey with in college was working at the National Hockey League. And he, whenever, so at the NHL, whenever there's an open job, they'll email all the employees and say, hey, we're hiring for this role. So he got an email that he thought would be appropriate for me. Mm -hmm. So eventually I got what was probably my dream job if I'm going to be an employee working and running the e-commerce marketing at the National Hockey League as a former hockey player is, <laughs> was a dream come true. So, you know, that's the, uh, you know, pretty much being my own boss is the only thing that I could think of that would have pulled me away from that from being in that role. Uh, but eventually I got to the point where I felt like I was ready to make that move and, and go work for myself full time. But again, it was five years into freelancing. And I actually had a, like what I would call a, a tripod strategy for, for deciding when it was time to make that leap. The first leg of the tripod was having six months of savings in the bank and and that was savings calculated based on what I would need as a freelancer, right? So in the U.S., health insurance costs go way up. If I'm going to go to a co-working space, um, other business expenses. So I, before I even left, I projected and figured out what those costs would be and made sure I had six months at that run rate in the bank. And that's the first thing. And, and I know a lot of people are like, oh, my six months, that would take forever. But to me, that's actually a good thing because if you're not making enough money on the side that you can't relatively quickly save up six months of expenses, right. how do you expect to pay your bills right. with, you know what I mean? So so to me, the ability to save six months of, of your living expenses in a relatively short time frame shows that you're making enough money right. that it will then be sustainable for you when you leave your full-time job. Yep. So that was one piece. The other piece was having two two, at least two, maybe three, like warm leads in my pipeline that I was confident when I left my job would have at least some decent chance of closing. Okay. And then the third thing was what I thought was actually the most creative thing that I did was at the NHL, we got summer Fridays. Mm -hmm. So I saved up all my vacation days to, and I told my boss, Hey, I don't have any travel plans. So I'm actually just going to take off Tuesdays and Thursdays every week this summer Plus we had a half day on Friday. So that gave me half of my week free. And then I signed a client on retainer while I was taking that time off to make sure. So I got to basically test drive what it would be like to be working for myself for entire days at a time during that period. And I got to sign a client on retainer that I knew would likely be there when I left my job 
and I could make sure that that was all working for six weeks before I ran out of vacation time. So once all those things were in place, then I could leave and I left my job with one retainer client signed in the bank already paying me, other potential clients in the pipeline and six months of expenses to fall back on so that you know, if I lost my retainer client, well, I could probably replace them with some of the, somebody else from the roster and I could fall back on my savings. Or if none of those new leads panned out, I still had that one client on retainer that would at least cover most of my bills and I still had the savings. Right. So between all three of those things, I felt like I really had, had that stability yeah. where almost no matter what happened, I was going to be okay. Yeah. And that allowed me to, 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 to really, I, you know, I, I'm proud of the fact that every year since then my income has grown and I feel like it's because I've, I gave myself that solid foundation and I didn't just jump into it and like, I know, you know, there's that gift where the guy's just like throwing papers all over the place and he's like quitting in a, in like a firestorm. Right. And then, you know, cause, cause once you start scrambling, you know, you get into that feast or famine cycle and it's really hard to break out of. So yeah, for me, your creativity and your ability to work and it's just, it's very tough to get out of. Um, it's interesting that you had multiple bases covered and I, I want to lean in a little bit to that third, that third element that you shared, because you know, there's a lot of conversation around the financial preparation for freelancing, having a backup plan, having an emergency savings fund, all that stuff. But I don't think a lot of people talk about the physical and like emotional and environmental changes that take place when you don't have the structure that you're used to with a full-time job. So even if you don't like your full-time job, there are like psychological structures in place to help you get shit done. And I think a lot of people, they're like, I have six months of savings. Like I have some referrals. I'm ready to go. And they sit down at their desk on day one. They're like, what do I do? So I, <laughs> I want to learn more about like those Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays. Like, were there any shocks to your system? Were there things that you're glad you learned ahead of time when you went full time that you knew that you were ready for? That's a great question. Um, I don't think that I had any real shocks to the system, but I guess what what's comforting is that if I were if in a in a universe where there would have been a shock, yeah. I would have had that experience in a sort of safer, more constrained environment. Right. Uh, again, I think the fact that I had been freelancing for for five years up to that point was was part of the reason that that I didn't run into anything sort of out of the ordinary or unexpected at that point. Right. But that's not to say it couldn't have happened, right? Just the, the fact that it didn't happen doesn't mean that there wasn't the potential. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just just because just because you're sort of cautious and you put a plan in place to cover a worst case scenario, it doesn't mean that that's wasted if the worst case scenario doesn't happen to occur because you know, that's, that's just a coin flip. And, you know, eventually you're going to, that, that worst case scenario will come to fruition. So being, having that, that, that discipline to always be trying to protect your, your, your risk and your downside, I think is, is an important thing to get, get comfortable with. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I'm definitely more of a risk averse person as well. So I can, I can relate to that. 